with your slam, so no way to go back. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. So, uh, first of all, um, I want to. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. I'm Wafa El Saber, ICAP Global Director, and I really am thrilled that we're all here today to acknowledge uh, World AIDS Day. Um, for the young folks in the, in the room, uh, World AIDS Day was established in 1988, and uh, probably in the darkest years of the HIV epidemic. Um, and uh, I think it was established at that point in time as a way of galvanizing the global community around the threat and uh, the global HIV pandemic that was raging at that point in time. And over the years, every year, we celebrate World AIDS Day on December 1st, every year. Uh, and it's usually organized and coordinated by UNAIDS. And uh, every year there's a theme to World AIDS Day, and that's important. And uh, actually looking back, um, I, I was reflecting on the different themes over the years, and they kind of are almost like a, a roadmap of the important issues and the highlights of the evolution of the HIV epidemic as well as the evolution of the response to the HIV epidemic. Uh, for example, um, there have been years that we focus on youth, like we're focusing today on youth, uh, but that was way back in 1989, so it was acknowledged again the importance of youth in the HIV epidemic from early on, the earliest years. And then there was AIDS in the family in uh, 1994, then One World, One Hope was 1996, and if uh, some of you will recall, that was the year where uh, treatment for HIV was discovered, effective treatment. So it was a big year in 1996 that brought new hope uh, to the world. You know, other themes have been men make a difference. We know the challenge of men and engaging men in HIV and health-related programs. And then stigma and discrimination is a theme that runs across and has been the theme of the, UN, of, um, the World, AIDS program, uh, World AIDS Day for several times, actually, because, again, it is a thorny issue. How do we overcome a stigma and discrimination? This year's theme for World AIDS Day is very important. Uh, the theme is communities make the difference. And I think if there's one thing that we've learned from day one in the HIV response is the fundamental critical role of the community in everything we do or want to do. And this is something obviously at the ethos of what ICAP does, but is also at the center of the uh, global HIV response, the importance of engaging the community in all its diversity. People living with HIV, people at risk for HIV, uh, different populations around the world, whether they be right here in a community in Harlem, in the Bronx, uh, in Upper Manhattan, in Washington Heights, or in the many countries where ICAP works. So I think in, overall, I always say that um, World AIDS Day is about three things. It's about, I would say number one is about remembering, number two is about celebrating, and number three is about acting. Um, I think it is about remembering, uh, remembering um, you know, a lot of uh, the people we lost to the HIV epidemic over the years, and certainly for someone like myself and many people in this room, we have memories that go back a long way of losses uh, of remarkable people that we lost uh, over the generation, uh, the decades of the epidemic. We need to remember them and their struggles and, um, and think about them on World AIDS Day. The second thing is celebrating, and I think we have to celebrate and must celebrate the remarkable advances in the HIV response, the availability of life-saving treatment, the availability of um, prevention methods, the engagement of communities, the coming together of the global, uh, the global community to get the resources to be able to respond to the HIV epidemic. There's a lot to celebrate, and we celebrate that now people living with HIV can live long and healthy lives, and that's really important. And lastly, it's about acting. We can't stop here and rejoice in what we've accomplished, we have to think ahead, planning and acting, uh, by thinking about the gaps that still remain, the challenges are still there. Uh, there are more, only about 60% of people living with HIV around the world have access to treatment. So that's only a little more than half. So there's a huge number of people who are still lacking access to treatment. And just this past year, there were 1.7 million new HIV infections globally, 
which means we have a long way to go in prevention as well. Uh, so this is kind of a moment in time to take stock of what we've accomplished and think about what we need to accomplish uh, moving forward. Um, and that's the reason for coming together here and the need for focusing on the theme, our own theme here, growing up positive, which is uh, reflecting what we've done for young people, but even more important, thinking what more we need to do and must do for young people around the world, living with HIV or at risk uh, for HIV. So beyond this first introduction, and I guess uh, sort of giving you a sense of the history of World AIDS Day and its importance to all us, uh, the global community, uh, in, uh, in addressing and confronting the epidemic, um, I would then like to welcome uh, Dean Linda Fried, uh, who's the Dean of the Mainland School of Public Health, an enormous supporter of ICA, uh, a person who's been involved in HIV, has done HIV work herself uh, for several years, and who's been behind all of our work, uh, both here in the US and globally, to try to confront the HIV epidemic. Thank you very much, Linda, and please, uh, we welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Rafa. Um, I wanted to add my own words of welcoming everybody. Um, this is such an important day. I, I was actually thinking that the world has been at this since 1981, as we all know. So it's been 38 years. Um, I actually personally remember the first patients who arrived at NIH with what turned out to be HIV. Um, not because I was there, but my husband was the fellow in Tony Fauci's um, program and took care of those first patients. But I also, um, you know, remember the bad old days of our hospitals drowning in really sick patients, who many of whom didn't survive. So um, to be able to be at this point, in history, where there is a lot to celebrate, is, is something I just want to mark. And it's the result of the, the commitment, the accomplishments, the science, the translation, the innovation, um, and the work together that everybody in this room has been uh, dedicated to, but also that we do with communities locally and around the world. And it takes this level of partnership and beyond that to accomplish the kind of transformation that we can celebrate. Um, public health is, to my mind, is about creating the future. And in addition to celebrating what we're always responsible for saying, how do we create the best possible future together, using science, using knowledge, seeking for what we don't know, and then building it better together. And so I can't think of a better title than, I would actually split this title into two parts. Growing up, which until the advent of antiretroviral therapy, children born with HIV who were HIV positive didn't have the opportunity to do. They now have the opportunity to grow up and live long and full lives in, with, uh, with health. Um, that's an immense thing to celebrate. And the challenge now is... <laughs> the challenge now is to how to begin to do what I know today's workshop is about, which is to create the platforms that enable them to, to walk into and be part of full lives that they're now capable of. So um, thank you for all of your leadership. Um, what you do is so important every single day for everybody. And thank you for what I know will be the inspiration for a better future. Thank you very much, Nancy. We very much appreciate uh, your, your words and also your being here. Um, you're in for a wonderful uh, program today, and uh, I was talking to you and saying we have a totally multimedia event, as I said, that will include presentation, a panel discussion. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to also 
uh, watch a very uh, wonderful uh, documentary movie that has been made that's uh, about adolescents living with HIV, as well as our own uh, a small uh, video clip of um, the workshop, the photography, photography workshop uh, that, we, that I have supported also. Um, and after that, we, have, we will be um, having uh, the, um, what do you call it, the um, unveiling, ribbon cutting, unveiling, that's the word I was looking for, the unveiling of some of the amazing work of the youth, the adolescents in Kenya, who took these amazing photographs that you saw some of them walking in, we'll be unveiling a permanent display of these, uh, some of these photographs in the student lounge around the corner, so at the end of the event, we all walk there and do a ribbon cutting and uh, celebrate uh, their work as well. So uh, without further ado, to get us going, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and that's uh, my good friend and colleague, Elaine Abrams. And uh, <laughs> uh, we don't know Elaine, Elaine and I go back now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of scary, isn't it? 35 years, that's scary. Uh, but uh, we go back a long way and uh, have been colleagues and friends. She was very young. <laughs> she was very, very young then. Uh, I wasn't so young. Uh, but um, I think we've worked together uh, both at Harlem Hospital for decades and then worked to, are working together now at ICAP, uh, doing amazing work. And uh, Elaine is the... Uh, at ICAP, she's the research director uh, for all of our programs. She's the senior research director. And she's really been at the center of all our work that relates to children, adolescents, uh, and uh, mothers living with HIV. So she's going to give us a snapshot of what's going on now uh, in relation to HIV and youth. Welcome, Elena. Thank you. Thanks, Wafa. And since we're Getting personal, I think it, the title is very apt because I grew up with HIV and started my career in Harlem. And there are wonderful people who I started my career with who are here today. And um, started at the time that Linda referred to when our lives were filled with loss. And then we saw an incredible transformation as we introduced antiretrovirals. And um, at the time that I was pregnant with my now 28-year-old twins, we started to treat moms and kids with antiretrovirals. And that was really the beginning of the transformation, allowing children who were born with HIV to grow up positive. So um, I feel like I've been witness and party to some truly amazing, amazing work. Also, the, the community theme stretches across this room because so much of what we did together started at Harlem. And then we had the um, unique opportunity to take that learning and bring it to particularly Sub-Saharan Africa um, and try and figure out how to bring um, treatment and services to families, kids, young people with HIV. So on that note, I'll just give you a little bit of background about the epidemic in young people uh, to set the stage for what I think is going to be a fabulous program. I'm not assuming that I can. Ah, thanks. So it's always important to start an HIV talk with some of the global statistics just to, to frame our, our thinking and to recognize that there are close to 38 million people globally living with HIV, including um, 36.2 million adults and 1.7 million children. As Wafa mentioned in 2018, there are 1.7 million new HIV infections, including 160,000 in children less than 15 years of age. And we continue to see an unacceptably high number of deaths attributed to HIV 
at 770,000 in 2018. Space bar. There we go. Now, um, as you might have noticed, most of our the numbers, the global numbers, refer to children who are less than 15 and adults older than 15 and above. But adolescents and young people sort of traverse both both of these groups. And as you can see here, there are somewhat confusing terminology. But generally, when we talk about adolescents, it's the 10 to 19-year-olds. Youth are 15 to 24-year-olds. And we're really going to be talking about young people today, which we can say fall into the 10 to 24 age bracket. But it is generally a transitional time, somewhere between childhood and adulthood. And age is generally less important than that many developmental and physical changes that take place. So if we're looking specifically at adolescents living with HIV in that 10 to 19 year group, there are an estimated 1.6 million living with HIV infection globally. There were 33,000 deaths in this age group and 190,000 new infections in 2018, three quarters occurring in adolescents who were girls. As we look at the older age group, the 15 to 24, recognizing the overlap, the number ex increases dramatically to 5 million infected globally, over a half million new infections in 2018, um, and 62% among girls. We don't know the number of deaths in this age category because the data are generally not disaggregated. Now, there are two unique populations of young people living with HIV. And this slide is borrowed from, from Claude Mellons, who you'll be meeting soon. The first group are those with perinatal acquisition of HIV infection, and they're children or adolescents who are exposed to the virus um, in utero or during breastfeeding and acquired HIV, in in HIV infection at that time. This is a growing population as children with HIV are successfully treated globally we're seeing fewer and fewer new pediatric infections and more children living into adolescence. Um, many of the oldest children had very late initiation of antiretroviral treatment and are not only living with HIV, but also with the complications of HIV infection as well as the treatment. And many of these young people have experienced loss of parents, siblings, family members, but still are living within families or with caretakers. We also see an increasingly large um, group of young people who require HIV infection sexually. There's a youth bulge in sub-Saharan Africa with increasingly large numbers of youth who are um, at risk for acquiring HIV infection, and these tend to be the older adolescents in the 20, 15 to 24 year old age group, sexually active, independent, and um, three quarters are women. And this group has the highest HIV incidence of any uh, age group. And as you can see, the concerns, the health, the health needs are somewhat different for these two groups of individuals. Um, however, both have very similar challenges across these two populations. They're living with a highly stigmatized chronic fatal infection. They have to take lifelong medication daily, hopefully once a day, but oftentimes more often. They have to manage the complications of HIV and the treatment, and they have to navigate the bumpy, circuitous, and often treacherous road from childhood to adulthood. 
And I think everybody in this room has likely been through adolescence. Maybe some of you are still in adolescence <laughs> or have children who have gone through adolescence. And I think everybody knows what I mean about a bumpy, treacherous road. So this, um, the com complexity of living with HIV and the challenges of effective treatment are probably best represented in the 1990 cas cascade. Um, and one of the mantras or targets that we are trying to achieve globally is for 90% of people living with HIV to know that they have HIV infection, that 90% of those are on effective treatment, and that 90% on treatment achieve viral suppression. So if you take your medicines every day and they work well, you should have no detectable virus in your blood. You're not cured, but you have an undetectable virus. And if we look at this, let's see, if we look here, first the, the, we're looking at um, those who know their status, the proportion of people who um, are living with HIV, estimated proportion, who know their status by age group, with red being this 15 to 24 age group, and the older age groups represented with the two blue bars. And as you can see, the proportion in Uganda, according to our population health impact assessments, um, um, the proportion who are in this young people age group is substantially lower at 40% compared with the older age groups. And you see the same trend across on treatment, so if those who know their status, um, a lower proportion are on treatment, and the same for viral suppression. And we see similar patterns across different countries and we certainly have seen the same thing in, in the U.S. and in Europe, that adolescents compared, compared to adults generally have poorer outcomes. And this has a direct impact on mortality. We've seen a drop in HIV-related deaths globally, been declining over the last decade, two decades. But as you can see in the blue line, We've actually had a no substantial change and maybe even an increase in deaths among adolescents. So they don't know they have HIV, they're not effectively getting treated and not reaching viral suppression. So I, um, we at ICAP have spent considerable time um, thinking about how best to meet the needs of, of adolescents and young people in the context of our service program and um, have conceived a fairly comprehensive approach to both trying to prevent new infections in adolescents as well as providing care and services to those living with HIV. Um, trying to prevent new infections for a variety of different programs, including counseling and screening and pro providing PrEP to expanding testing services, linking adolescents to adolescent-friendly HIV care services, and then trying to support adolescents um, in care uh, as well as their adherence. And uh, across this entire diagram, you'll see that there's great attention to, to peer services, to community input, and to engaging adolescents and young people with HIV in their own care. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of the kind of work that we do. Um, this is a youth led assisted self-testing program for 15 to 24 year olds in South Africa where late counselors were trained to become champions for HIV self-testing and they conducted assisted self-testing helping other youth to test themselves for HIV 
on college campuses. In a three-week period, they engaged over 5,000 young people to self-test. Um, in another prevention program in Tanzania, um, part of what's called a DREAMS effort, these are efforts to um, prevent infections, particularly in young women where um, prevalence and incidence is quite high. Um, this was a specific program for out-of-school, sexually active adolescent and girls and young women in remote um, area of Tanzania, uh, including Lake Victoria Island. And it was a comprehensive set of, of services that included um, communication, family planning, counseling, and financial literacy training, which was quite, quite interesting. Um, to support these young young women to, to um, delay sexual abuse. Actually, these were sexually active young women, but to, to keep, keep them safe in their communities and, and on track um, in, in their lives. And over 10,000 young women completed the program in uh, 2019. We've created safe spaces for adolescents in many of our country programs. This is a uh, adolescent-friendly clinic in Cote d'Ivoire that I included renovation and outfitting of a, a space where adolescents could come and meet and also um, be prepared for their health visits, as well as developing a peer educator program where young people were encouraged to build a mentorship here, learning and support. And then um, Project Hope in Kenya focused particularly on pregnant adolescents, uh, establishing a group care system where young women came in in groups for their antenatal care. And within those groups, we could layer a variety of services and opportunities for these young women to talk about their HIV infection. <laughs> And these are just pictures of um, the moms and some of their postnatal visits with the babies. And um, they all received certificates and had a graduation at six months post postpartum when they transitioned back to routine, routine care. So I'll just end by talking about um, the photo workshop series, and you'll, you'll see and learn more about this. In 2016, ICAP, in collaboration with the School of Journalism and um, Melbourne School of Public Health, submitted a proposal to Columbia's um, President of Global Innovation Fund. And building on the assets of the Global Center in Nairobi, in collaboration with Amy Edith, who you'll meet, um, very shortly, we put together a proposal to hold a series of photo workshops in Kisumu, Kenya, with adolescents and young people living with HIV. And the objectives of the workshop were to promote self-expression and communication, and to build new skills and knowledge about digital photography in a safe and structured environment. And the workshops included in, uh, four days of instruction, followed by practice um, with one day exhibition. And we had four professional photographers working with the youth. We actually had so much interest, we had to have a lottery to choose who would, would participate. And um, this rather modest proposal, I think over the last several years, has taken over some people's lives as um, the, this photograph first photography workshop was incredibly, incredibly successful and um, went on to do a second workshop and um, several ex exhibitions. And now some of the young people are learning uh, video photography and have continued to keep up the work that they, they started both for economic reasons, but also because it was such a um, unique opportunity to learn these skills and to make, to make this kind of contact that they had never 
had before in their lives. So photographs coming out of, of um, this workshop um, and the work they've done since will, will be on display. Um, they finally were part of an entrepreneurship workshop at the Global Center in Nairobi where they conceived of a way to take their learning and turn it into a business, which um, turned out to be an unexpected and, and wonderful um, output of these workshops. So on that note, I'll um, turn it back over to Wafa. And um... uh, thank you very much, Elaine. And thank you for sharing the examples of uh, uh, the work that she and others at ICAP have supported over the years, particularly uh, working with youth. Um, I think we're now going to move on to the next um, part of our, our program, which is going to be a video screening. And this is the screening of a, of a video that's called Life Growing Up. And uh, this short film was actually created by young people who have grown up living with HIV. And, um, and it's written, of, uh, it reflects real, their real stories. It's actors, but they're representing the real stories of young people living with HIV. And... Um, I think we're very uh, uh, fortunate that actually the organization that created this um, video, which is the Children's HIV Association of the UK, uh, they were very eager and welcomed us uh, showing this video today to all of you. So. It's hard to speak after this. Um, I'll get there. So, um, thank you for watching this uh, film. I think it. Um, I think it gives us a snapshot of what young people have to go through. Um, young people are living with HIV. Um, so, at this point in time, I think we're going to move on to our panel discussion. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Please come up uh, to the front. And I'm going to introduce them very briefly. They're very um, accomplished people. And we could spend the whole afternoon describing their many accomplishments. But I'm going to uh, describe, just tell you a little bit about them. And, uh, and then you can get to know them afterwards. So um, I've introduced already Elaine Abrams, and you heard from her, so I'm not going to repeat what I said, an old friend and colleague. Not old. A long-standing, a long-standing friend and colleague, even though we've known each other for now 30 years. Um, next to Elaine is um, Claude Mellons. Thank you, Claude. And Claude is a professor here. She's a clinical psychologist, professor of medical psychology, and she's co-director of the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies. And uh, she has done amazing work, numerous research projects all over the world, in the US, right here, as well as in South Africa, Uganda, and Thailand. And she really focuses on very important fundamental issues to HIV, and especially HIV amongst youth. The stress and trauma, mental health, neurocognitive development, sexual drug use behavior, as well as uh, adherence to treatment and the care of vulnerable um, adolescents and young adults. So thank you very much, uh, Claude, for joining us today. And then next to Claude is Amy, Amy Bedek. And Amy is a, also um, a friend and a neighbor of mine as well. And uh, she received her uh, bachelor's in fine arts in photography from the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And subsequent to that, she's worked in a variety of different settings at Yale University, as well as uh, in the photo uh, photograph collection of Victor and Albert the Museum in London, Musée Carnavalet in Paris. And her own photographs have been um, 
shown in a variety of settings internationally. She also earned a master's in fine arts in screenwriting and directing from Columbia University's graduate film uh, program. And she's worked in the film industry here in New York and has been a partner in the project that Elaine briefly described, the photography workshop uh, that uh, uh, she was instrumental in really making it happen. And then next to Amy is uh, Ruby Fiorsi, and Ruby is a pediatrician, uh, two decades of experience supporting HIV uh, programs for children, adolescents, and young people. And she's the deputy director of ICAP's clinical and training unit. And Ruby joined ICAP in 2005, quite a while ago, as pediatric advisor, and she's been very involved in supporting many of our pediatric and adolescent programs um, in Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, Mozambique, South Sudan, and Democratic Republic of Congo. And she has training in uh, pediatrics, but also in, in pediatric infectious disease, and has a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. And then finally, at the end, right there, uh, is Akina McCarthy. And Akina is 24 years old. Yay. I think you're probably the youngest person in the room. Is that true? So she's the one person who actually fulfills the definition of youth. And uh, she's a young woman. Uh, she's um, uh, she is uh, born and raised in the Bronx, and she started attending the Harlem Family Care Clinic since 2006. That's the clinic where Elaine and I worked for many many years, and we actually established that clinic together many many years ago at Harlem, and she started being followed in the clinic in 2006. Uh, she's a young woman who is living with HIV. She perinatally acquired HIV. And she's now uh, a very <coughs> important person at the Family Care Center in Harlem. She's a peer counselor, has been working as a peer counselor for five, year, five years now, and is also, as well, completing a peer certification pro program to become a certified peer. Elaine mentioned, and I mentioned, the importance of community, and peers are the backbone of the effective response to HIV. And she's also playing a dual role at Harlem, uh, both as a peer counselor, but also as a mental health patient navigator and patient advocate. Welcome, Akina. We're very thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Um, so maybe I'll start with the questions in the panel. I'm going to ask some questions of some of the people up front, but also we want to get questions from all of you. Uh, so there'll be people with microphones at some point. Uh, but um, um, I'm going to start with a question to, uh, I'm going to start with Amy. Um, so Amy, and the microphones, I think, are, I hope they work. But um, I think, in, uh, you know, when we started first talking about the workshop, the photography workshop, what did you, what did you hope it would accomplish from um, your perspective? I think the, can you move it up? Oh, my, sorry. Disconnected. Can you hear me through this thing? Um, what I hoped it would accomplish is kind of what was talked about in this video. I hoped that we would be able to um, give a voice to young people who were being treated at this clinic in Kasumu who might not be able to express their innermost feelings to the general public and to help them talk about their lives um, give us insight into their lives, and for me it succeeded beyond my expectations because the young people we worked with were so ready to, to talk and to be seen and to be heard, and also ready to discover a tool for, for that experience. Uh, and I think you know, digital photography in a way is a perfect means to that end because it is relatively easy to re acquire the skills um, and you get instant results, which you'll all see outside um, when you have a chance to look at the photographs that came out of those workshops. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think the other, the other thing that I hoped as we sort of went through the workshop was that um, they would continue to, to do this work um, after we left, which is something that has happened. There's sort of a core group of young people who, as I think um, Elaine mentioned, have kind of banded together and are determined to use the tools that they developed through the workshops and afterwards 
to create a business that will hopefully enable them to support themselves, which obviously is a huge issue. And that's finding a way to to support oneself, at least in Kisungu, Kenya, is not an easy thing. Um, and to do it, it sort of with through a process that enables you to show other people who you are is, is an exciting thing. And um, uh, Claude, and your work over the years, in, uh, both here and um, and elsewhere, um, I mean, and I'm going to ask the same question of several people on this panel, but you know, what are the kind of similarities and differences that you see uh, between the work that you do in New York versus the work you do <coughs> overseas? Um, so like uh, Elaine, I also grew up uh, in, um, I started my first job here in 1990, 1990. So it was the very you know, beginning, and I think um, at that point we were watching babies and children that we didn't expect to survive their fifth birthday, as we said at that point, and then all of a sudden we had treatment and they could really reach adolescence. And so when I started working with adolescents, um, there are all the things around uh, that the young people talked about around disclosure and stigma and discrimination and having to take medications and feeling sick or losing people or growing up in environments that were really tough with a lot of economic and social disparities. And when I first started going to Africa and different countries in Africa and Asia, I really thought I wouldn't understand adolescence in these countries or what it was like growing up with HIV, but what I actually found instead is that in all of these contexts, young people have unbelievable resilience. And in spite of all of those things I just listed for you, as you saw in the young people here, um, they, were, they were going to high school, they were graduating high school, they were maybe going to college, they were... Um, having relationships, they were figuring out how to navigate that, they were having healthy children actually, they were engaged in meaningful relationships and it was that resilience across all of these contexts that has really stuck out for me as something that's universal. Um, and, and many of them are thriving in spite of incredible challenges as that young man showed. There are definitely mental health challenges and there are definitely learning problems, but they, with our support and the support of their communities, are really thriving. And Ruby, from your end, you've had kind of similar experiences both in this country and elsewhere. What, um, how, is, how have you seen the different similarities between your work in Harlem and your work overseas? So the work in Harlem really informed a lot of what we did overseas and I think Elaine mentioned early on that with MTCT Plus, the family focused uh, module of care which ITEP has implemented, we took that module also to Sub-Saharan Africa. I joined Harlem in 2006 and at the time the median age of the children we were seeing at the hospital who were perinatally infected was about 13 years. And we quickly realized that incorporating peer supports was really critical. So during that time, we restructured the clinic and introduced um, peer support. We had our multidisciplinary team meetings where we came together, case managers, um, clinical psychologists, the psychiatrist, and the clinicians, making sure that we're providing comprehensive care to um, children and adolescents living with HIV. And all those lessons that we learned, really, we had, took them and applied them into Sub-Saharan Africa. So one of the, uh, what do you call it, training guidelines that we developed, which we've used in, in a lot of countries, and then you talked about Cote d'Ivoire, this is the healthcare um, training curriculum for adolescents living with HIV. We also developed a training curriculum for peers living with HIV, which is the positive voices, positive choices. We used all the lessons really from um, program implementation here at Harlem Hospital to inform the work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm proud to say that across the board in a lot of ICAP-supported um, countries, we have youth-friendly services, we have adolescent psychosocial support groups, we have adolescent peers who are providing psychosocial support to, um, what do you call it, adolescents living with HIV. 
and programs like the one we've just started um, in Kenya in terms of supporting the adolescents to be able to not just express themselves but look for avenues to learn life skills and to also get some income generation activities have really been in the forefront of what we've tried to do and across the board most of the time when we ask adolescents what do they really want is really to have their peers support them and then also make sure that we are equipping them not just to be healthy but also to be able to be productive um, adults and citizens in the community. Thank you Ruby and uh, Akina just um, uh, can you share with this group here some of your experiences um, in growing up positive? Some of my experiences. Uh -huh. One of my greatest experiences that I've been through anyway is like the transition from like liquids to like pills mm. and things of that nature. Um, mm. Doctor therapy, DOT, whatever that that is. DOT, directly observed therapy. Um, and also, just to pick up the phone, like the camps, like those were like a real. Oh, the camps. Yeah, the Tell camps. people about the camps. Yeah. All right, so mm -hmm. the camps was like, because like, I was disclosed to at like a teenage year, so like the camps was like a beautiful place. If you weren't disclosed to, it was like going away to Disneyland for a week. Of course, you were crying the first week, but the last week, you crying for one week. And it was a beautiful place upstate where it's like, you got to like really have like outdoor activities. So as a kid from the city, you never see like, okay, we got to sleep outside one time, it was really weird. Just <laughs> sleeping outside. And it was like, we had like what? In the morning, because it was like a regular routine. So like in the morning, if you had your medication, your AM meds, you would get up and before you went outside to go get the breakfast, they would have like lined up, it was beautiful. But they did all that. It's like, oh, well, you know, everybody who takes morning meds, you gotta get in line. It's like a long line to get to the nurse's station where it's like, okay, Water, juice, or milk, which is your poison, because you know you gotta take your pills, so it's like, what do you want? It's a shot afterwards. They seem like little shot glasses with medication. And it's like, you got to pick either water, juice, or chocolate or milk. And like if you're like if you had liquids, if you still had liquids and you were in camp, it was awesome because they gave you some soda. It wasn't giving them soda back then. They were giving them soda. And it was beautiful because like until I got disclosed to it was like everybody in there knew your stat except for you. You got to be a normal kid and everybody else taking medication. So it's like Oh, that's really beautiful. It was like one of my greatest experiences when I was HIV was being around them. And also having like a drop-in center. So it was like, also, when you became a teenager, by the time you were like 13, you were allowed to go to drop-in. Drop-in happened almost every Friday. And it's like, after you come to school, you can sit here with your peers. If you had a problem with HIV or whatever, heck, you know, it wasn't taking your meds the week, you and your peers come up with a plan, or better yet, you can just sit there and play recreational games. You know what's our was our experience. <laughs> so you would sit there and play that at school. So yeah, we had like a lot of social supports around that. Even if you didn't know why you were getting social support, so it was just nice to have mm. a weird community of people that just got you. Like it was really weird. It was like being in a club mm. away from home. So yeah. That sounds like yeah, I remember Elin, uh, you would spend uh, a week up there at the, the camp, being the camp doctor, right? Yeah. And um, you know, in, in many ways, I think the, um, as several of you have said, the care and treatment has evolved so much and been transformed over the years. And I know that one of the big issues has been the transition from pediatrics sort of to adults, and both in terms of the individual experience, but also in terms of the care system. And maybe Elaine, you can talk, we, we used to talk a lot about how are we gonna get the, the children out of the pediatric clinic into the adult clinic, and that transition is, complex and toy. <laughs> sure, um, because at some point, as these young people grow older, they have to leave the pediatric clinic. And I think the tendency was to make that age older and older and older <laughs> because of the incredible bonds that were formed by taking care of, you know, between the health providers and these teams of people who took care of kids for their entire lives. Um, and they were going off into that, you know, cold adult <laughs> clinic yeah. where they wouldn't That's get the I kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was not cold. cold. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, different. <laughs> but, but it was really about transitioning from childhood to mm -hmm. adulthood and all of the things that that carried. 
and being ready to take on your own care and to move forward in life and to leave that childhood behind. That turns out to be a very individual process, but our, our systems often use arbitrary cutoffs to make make that, that transition. I think we talked, and everybody has worked very hard to try and figure out the timing and the process by which young people transition from uh, mm -hmm. child clinics to adult clinics. When we started working overseas, one of the really interesting things was that there was no adolescent medicine. There was really no recognition of adolescence as a time period. You were a kid or you were an adult. And I can remember one of the pediatricians basically saying to me, oh, they do whatever I want. I tell them to take their pills, and they take their pills. I shook my hand and said, oh, you have no idea. Just wait. And we have since um, done similar work overseas to try and um, support that transition process um, through, often through peer work to make sure that young people aren't lost as they go from Pediatrics, adult medicine. And maybe Claude, you've done work obviously regarding disclosure and um, when, I mean, when is the right, I mean, this is something that comes up all the time, and I'll get back to Akina about this is, you know, when is the right age, when is the right time, what's the right mechanism to disclose to the child that they have HIV, who's the right person to do it? What are your thoughts on it? This complex issue. All, all those really easy questions, and you know, I'm going to be so curious to hear what you have to say. I think my experience clinically, and I think my experience talking to young people at all ages, is the first answer is there is no answer. There is no one answer. There's no um, one person. There's no one way. There's no one age. Um, and it's also not a one-time event. And I think that's where we all get stuck is everybody thinks disclosure is this moment where you're told or you're not told. And um, I think what's become so clear to us, um, and I could share a lot of stories, but I, I, I'd rather hear from Akina on that. But I think what's become clear to us is it really is a process. And what you get told at four or six or eight or 12 is really different than how you understand things when you're 13, 17, 20, even if you were told something when you were younger. And so I think what's been most critical is understanding the child or the adolescent and developmentally where they are and what they can process and understand, but also understanding the family. Um, and so one of the things that was really frustrating early on was everybody think in their head had at 10 years old you should tell them but if a child wasn't developmentally ready at 10 or maybe they were developmentally ready at 8 or a family wasn't ready to support them in that process it wasn't a good moment so we made mistakes of telling youth before they were ready who had experiences um, like that young woman I, I actually worked with somebody who at 9 told her best friend and then all of a sudden she was the quote-unquote cootie girl at school and she had to switch schools mm -hmm. and and that was a process where the mother wanted to tell her at that moment but she wasn't developmentally ready or other times when the family just said you have HIV and then we're not going to talk about it anymore as somebody else in the film said and then the child is left there holding this information so again I think it's knowing where the child is and knowing um, the support system around them as they have questions and as different things come up and they have to work on them. Maybe Akina, you want to add something regarding, you know, your experience, disclosure, and what you think is the right way, maybe, or one way to do it? Yeah. So, I basically don't have children, so I've never had to like, worry about, like, if my child is born positive, how to tell them, like, okay. But, um, I was actually disclosed to, I'm going to say, three times in my lifetime. And the first time was when I was really little, probably around six, when I was learning what asthma was. And, like, you know, you ask, like, why am I, as a kid, you know, like, why am I taking this? Like, why am I, why do I take the medicine? Was always my question. Why do I take this? Why do I take this? And she's like, well, you have a bug in you. And then telling your siblings that you have a bug in you, and now all of a sudden you got roaches in you. And that's why the medicine takes so much, because it's like that. Right like roach <laughs> and then being actually told like what it was like the actual word for word for word what it was after like what I got this close to where I'm saying tomorrow I got told that I was adopted so it was like really rich on the process that one and then that one and then I got sent to the clinic and that's when they told me what it was said that I got this close to like 
twice. So mm. like I just took like, and they told me what it was. It's like, I still don't get it. Mm. Like, so asthma, okay. So tell me what I can and can't do, okay. All right. And then in school, I guess that's when it's like, oh, this is what it is. And this is why it's so bad. So mm. it's like, if you're gonna disclose to somebody what I would say, it's like, it's important to know how much your child knows. And like mm-hmm. better yet, the best part about being a parent is that most kids look to you for information. So mm-hmm. you can hit them with the facts, you can dispel myths right then and there. If they have questions, you can answer those questions. Um, let them know that there's gonna be like stigma that's around there, but also let them know like it's not gonna happen. And also like with the whole telling of people, this this day and age, there's like that's always a good question. I still have like I'm still looking for the answer, they want to disclose something. But like never, one thing I learned is that you never, ever, 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 ever like text. Like nowadays, everybody wants to like share stuff online. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. There's screenshots, people leave receipts, and it's like you want to tell one person this. Do you know now? All of Facebook knows. And it's in like Times Square. And boom. <laughs> you gotta be careful who you disclose to, when to disclose to, and the best question I would like to ask when like about disclosing is why are you disclosing. Mm-hmm. Are you disclosing for yourself? Are you disclosing to keep your body? Are you disclosing for another reason? Mm-hmm. Like you have to really like really think about those things because once you disclose, like they say, once you put it out there, it's out there. Mm-hmm. And the worst part about that is that you really can't sue nobody for defamation if it's true, apparently. So it's like. <laughs> well, you're giving very good advice to all of us in terms of social media and how we deal with it. But thank you. Uh, I think we'll take some couple of questions from the audience. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. While you're thinking, okay. One question, please. Hi everyone. Um, so I was a teacher in the Bronx, actually, and I'm curious, Akina, being a peer mentor, how do you think? kids in the Bronx would react to a video, the video that we watched? Do you think that that's something that students would like absorb and that they would learn from? Or do you think they might kind of find it out of touch? Thank so, you. So this video, I feel like it would be very powerful. Now, it's the context of what you share this video, because I'm also from the Bronx, and I promise you, like the work I do right now, like the outreach and the speaking, I wouldn't do it in the Bronx. Maybe because people know me, and that's where I like stay and stuff like that. I don't want somebody to be like, hey, I just saw you on the news. What is all of this? All that good stuff. But yeah, this video was very powerful and I would share it with the Bronx. But also, you also have to remember something, because one thing I learned the hard way is that people, people know these facts. They know this. Like, not most people the video. That's why I would show the video. But most people know about the facts, about how you spread HIV, how HIV is spread, and what you can and cannot get it from. In the namesake of a joke, though, people won't. Like, that's where the stigma comes from, is the jokes around it. It's like, if we hit them with pure, hard facts. If you told somebody that going in, going outside without, like, sunscreen will give you cancer, nobody's going to sit be like, ah, you don't got sunscreen, you don't know what that means, chemotherapy. Nobody's going to say that. <laughs> but in the sake of HIV, somebody will be like, oh, no. Man, I got to, like, I forget, what's one joke that I always hate about HIV? Like, it's really bad. It's like, oh, no. You, you mess around with that girl and now you got all types of HIV, not HIV, they always say AIDS. All types of AIDS and stuff. Now you gotta go get, like, get, go get a test or something like that. And it's like, mm-hmm. you'll catch Hep C way faster than you'll catch HIV. Mm-hmm. Which is what I always say. But hey. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, Amy, coming back to you, I know that um, one of the highlights of the workshops is the day when the, um, the young people kind of show their photographs to them. Parents and loved, maybe loved ones and so on. And just tell us a bit more about that experience and um, um, of actually kind of sharing the product of their work with their loved ones. Well, the, so the, the workshop last, lasted four days in both cases, and with the goal being an exhibition at the end for family and friends and some local healthcare workers, um, and really anybody that the participants wanted to invite. And I think everybody approached that with enthusiasm um, and a little apprehension as to how the work would be received. I think pretty much across the board, everyone who came, everyone who was invited to attend the exhibitions was amazed by the work that they saw um, and was touched by it as well. There was one moment during the first workshop um, when a young woman named Lizanne, who had 
photographed her father, who had really been a very important figure in her life, supporting her through her experience. Um, she wrote a sort of poem, and her father was there, and she had him stand up, and she showed his picture, and then she read his poem, and um, it was really, it was a pretty amazing experience. I think those kinds of things really touched a very wide group of people, and was really fascinating to to observe and participate in. So I think that the the pictures really. Um, show the parents and siblings and uh, other people who came to the exhibitions a different side of their family members that they hadn't really seen before. And I, and I hope, and I think it is true in certain cases, that a dialogue was established that continues. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting, and I think that there are several pictures that illustrate this out there, was um, how many of the participants viewed that the parents who supported them throughout their their lives um, and took very beautiful portraits, particularly of their mothers. So I hope you have a chance to see some of that. Uh, and, and today, um, I'm in touch with a number of former workshop participants who continue to photograph their families and, um, and their lives in a way that's very intimate, very personal, and they really don't hold back. Um, you know, I think that a lot of them, I don't know what they went through before I met them, but I have certainly heard that the peer groups that they participated in through the clinic in Kasumo have also sort of primed them to talk about their experiences and their lives in a way that is very, very supportive to them. Mm -hmm. so. um, yes. Uh, please, let's go to you next. Yeah. Um, hi, I see that PhD student here at Columbia. So we talk a lot about um, the science book um, perinatally um, and why issues. For a lot of the studies outside of the happy countries, for instance, Asia, we have a lot of young populations who essentially in the issues. So I'm wondering what the experience in the process of mm -hmm. uh, providing support and disclosure the any difference, you know, yeah. especially if the family support is not as strong as someone who would come to reality. It's a very good question. Maybe Claude, or maybe Ruby, even. Yeah, sort of the difference. I think you're talking about the difference between perinatally growing up with HIV versus sexually acquired. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can comment after Ruby. Yeah. So thank you for that um, point. Um, in our clinic at Harlem Hospital, initially we had primarily perinatally infected children. Um, as you're aware, the HIV epidemic in the city, um, proportionally in terms of um, new infections amongst children, has decreased significantly. New York State is one of those that is almost reaching elimination. And so the new um, HIV infected um, clients we're getting now, most of them are behaviorally infected, and it includes um, populations like, which are similar to those in Asia. And for a lot of those clients, typically what happens is um, for those who are referred to us, by the time they come in, because they're already diagnosed, they have already been told about their HIV status. So the disclosure has already happened before they come to us. What we try to do in terms of supporting them is helping them in terms of who else they're going to have to disclose to, especially because we know that they need support. You raise the issue about families. Um, there are some of these clients who do not have immediate families, but we ask them who else is in your support system. So it may not be a family member, it may be a, a friend or a, a distant relative, but we also try to make sure that they have that kind of support in terms of disclosing. And I think Akina mentioned an important fact around dis why do you want to disclose and who are you disclosing to? So it's not just about um, disclosing your status, but you want to make sure that in that process, you're doing it to one, um, help in terms of improve your own self-efficacy. So what we do in terms of that process, again, having peers support <coughs> them, talk to them about how they went about disclosing to their, um, what you call it, friends or peers 
is really critical. They don't want it to, to hear it from the, what do you call it, the medical provider. Hearing it from peers is really critical. So we use a lot of peer support to support them mm -hmm. in that disclosure process. Okay. Claudia, you want to add something? Um, there's a few things that are really similar. If, if I can go beyond disclosure mm -hmm. in that moment of learning your diagnosis, these are still young people who are needing to deal with their sexuality, with sexual behavior. They are still needing to cope with taking medicines every day for the most part. They are still wanting social support and relationships. They are still thinking about their future as a worker or as a parent or as a you know, spouse or, or in a relationship. And so all of those things remain really common no matter you know, who you are working with, where, and if I can try it to what you did with the photographs. I think what we've heard from parent youth who've grown up with perinatally acquired HIV or youth who um, uh, acquired HIV later in life, you know, what they want their providers to understand and their families to understand is that they are people first and they are young people first. Um, and that they are more than the pills, they are more than um, uh, factors, you know, or receivers in terms of transmission, they get really upset about that, that, that that's what everybody is focused on. But they have real lives and, and they want people to focus on that. And it doesn't really matter how you acquire the virus, that part is really still there. Thank you. Questions, please? Uh, maybe I have to go there. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I have a question for Dr. Ruby and Aquila. I will start with Dr. Ruby. I just want to, I'm curious about the work that you're doing in, in some countries in Africa. I just want to, like a brief experience that you have from the, that countries. I am from one of, I'm from Cape Verde, West Africa, and I'm really curious about, and also if your program, it's a program that's expanding for other countries, and what your experience, and, and the, the work that you've been doing there, um, what the message that you would, and comparing the different realities from the care that you give here in the US compared to the other countries. And for Akima, um, I'm really curious about your why, your why to being a peer counselor and your why to being here in front of everybody. Everybody knows that you're HIV positive and get this message because it's your why. That's, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, so Ruby, very quick, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think I mentioned earlier on, ICAP has um, implemented similar programs across the board in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not going to go through the whole list of countries, but all the lessons we learned from what we did in terms of providing support and clinical services for adolescents and, and youth living with HIV, we've applied that. So we have youth-friendly services, um, we also have peer support, in, in most of these countries, we are doing a one-stop shop module where we provide all the comprehensive care. So it's STI screening, mental health services. It's also psychosocial su support in addition to um, providing the clinical service. In terms of your last question where you asked what, what is different. So I think what is really different is the fact that here in New York City, there are lots of supportive services for adolescents and youth living with HIV. At Harlem Hospital, we have two special programs. One is the NOW program, which is new opportunities for women living with HIV. This is a special program where any um, young woman who is pregnant or has a child less than 18 years of age is able to access services. These services include not just transportation, we help them in insurance, we help um, with care coordination, making sure that they're able to come to the clinic, we make sure that if they need like um, food assistance, we um, provide that. And it's all funded through the Department of Health. We also have our HOPE program again in, in Harlem Hospital where we are providing comprehensive services. So again, it's not just about the medical care, it's also about the mental health um, support. We're also providing them with life skills. Um, we have part of the Harlem team over here in terms of dropping where the um, youth and adolescents can come and learn life skills. We're also providing them with transport reimbursements for when they come to the clinic. So I think the what is really different in terms of service provision is the fact that here in the city there are lots of additional services that we are able to provide for adolescents and youth living with HIV. Okay. Um, to answer your question as to why we came up here, Councillor. 
Um, so like, shout out to my medical team because I have like an awesome medical team. Like, what? You know, they kicked me out soon. Um, <laughs> but like, the real reason why I became a peer counselor, other than the fact that I needed a job, <laughs> is that. So what the things that they taught me, like they taught they skilled, they taught us a lot, like how to self manage. They're trying to prepare us, apparently, to move us out. But they really taught us a lot. So I retained the information very well. And then I realized something. I was approached like, hey, you retained the information well. Would you like to help your peers, like, you know, your other peers who are not doing so well? And then once I was told about what the role is and, like, you know, basically what a, what a peer counselor would do, or, like, my roles, I was like, yeah, sure. I had awesome models. Plus, now everybody wants to listen to people who are not. Living with, living, with, living with the virus. And it's also the certain things that I could talk to that my medical team and all their wonderful, beautiful, very expensive years of college cannot speak to me. <laughs> so after I started, what, after starting doing one year working with my peers, and like also, like they sent me out to learn more education, learn more about my role, learn more about how to take care of my health and manage my health. I honestly, truthfully, after learning all that information, I felt like it was not only my, it was like a duty. Like, I'm taking all this information from the team and I'm going back to my people like, hey, let me help you. Like, take this information, let me really help you. And it also makes it personal because I know at some point in time I did struggle with this. When I see my peers who are struggling, it's like I did struggle with this. And they probably, they really want to help you, but they don't understand you. I understand you. I got you. It's us. We in this together. And I came here today. Um, to share that information with everybody else. And I felt comfortable enough speaking here because, quite frankly, I'm never gonna see any of you again in my life. So. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be too sure. I might be ready to get you to join the school here. <laughs> Unfortunately, the dean has left, but you know. <laughs> um, you know uh, Unfortunately, we're running out of time for this panel. I mean, I think um, you heard a lot of different, obviously different perspectives by amazing uh, team we have here from providers to uh, famous photographer to Akina who joined us. So really, you can reach people we can never reach. And that's the honest truth. Uh, you can connect where we cannot connect. And we're grateful that you're doing this and doing this for your, your peers. And, uh, Ruby and Claude, thank you for your commitment to young people, both in the U.S. and around the world. And Amy, thank you for this workshop that was a gift. I felt it was a gift. Uh, it was an amazing gift. Whenever I'm traveling, and I was recently in Zambia, and before that I was in South Sudan, and I walk into the adolescent clinics and I say, we need a photography workshop here. It just, you know, this... Uh, opportunity to express themselves is just so unique and connect with their community is so unique. So we're committed to making this happen and replicating this in any in whatever we can do to make it happen. I think it has a, a durable effect on the lives of people that's going to be with them forever. And last but not least, Elaine, thank you uh, for all you've done in all those years and being a champion for young people uh, at risk and living with HIV. Elaine is a very humble human being, but she's really the world expert in terms of caring for uh, young people and children living with HIV. So I want to thank the panelists, and then after they come back to their seats, we're going to watch a very short um, video that was actually um, by, that was actually created by one of the workshop participants, Mercy. So Mercy created this uh, this little video based on her experience at the workshop and, um, and also including some of the other workshop participants. So. Before my pictures, they were not that good, but right now, due to that kind of experience, mm -hmm. at least I can take clear photos and say, wow, this is good. I was also given the camera to go and practice more. Slowly by slowly, I became one of the best photographers. Okay, I gained the courage, yeah. the courage to express myself, tell the world what I'm going through. It has given me the positive attitude of facing life. I believe your photos have been 
best seen by people inside and outside this room. How does that make you feel oh as my. a person? Oh my, there is a lot of happiness in me, yeah. making me to view life in a way that I can create a positive impact. I can change the life of that teenager somewhere who is HIV positive but is going under stigma. I can use this opportunity to transform their life. My photos being seen outside Kenya really inspired my life. I realize I can do a lot to change what my life truly is. And what do you tell our sponsors and the ICAP team? I would like to thank you very much for having helped me during this journey. I recommend you so much. I, I love it. My life is so good just because of you. I've learned photography just because of you. I'm taking my drugs well just because of you. My life has really changed since you, you entered and supported our facility. one in the first group uh, of uh, at the workshop so now she's actually interviewing people and she seized her moment. She seized her moment. Yes. 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 It's wonderful to see her and to see this uh, she's taking it to the next level. So um, thank you all for being with us today. At this point in time uh, I think we are um, maybe the people we are supposed